In 1848, the forces of reaction had put down popular uprisings in the Italian peninsula. The Bourbons were restored in Sicily, the Pope returned to Rome, Lombardy Venetia subjugated back under Habsburg rule, and the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia had been defeated. But among nationalists and revolutionaries, the dream of a unified Italy remained as potent as ever. The individual Italian fiefdoms, almost all ruled by foreign dynasties, could probably have been overcome at any time by nationalists, but always looming in the background was the threat from Vienna. So long as Austria claimed dominion over the peninsula, nationalism was held in check by the might of the Habsburg army. The only solution then was to defeat it in open battle. No revolution could possibly do so, it would require a professional military. And of the Italian states, only one had such a force and the will to use it. The Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia had long sought a way to harness Italian nationalism for its own benefit. In 1848, spurred on by nationalist revolutions, it had invaded Austrian territories, only to be driven out decisively the next year. The new king, Victor Emmanuel, still dreamed of exploiting nationalism to seize the rich provinces of Lombardy Venetia. But even he could not hope to drive the Austrian army out alone. The man who would be left to solve this puzzle was a short, shabbily dressed and brilliant aristocrat in his early 40s. A small landowner that had discovered a talent first for journalism and then for politics, the Count of Cavour was, in just a few short years, to reverse the Italian settlement completely. Edward Crankshaw described his political genius as more reminiscent of the great oil kings half a century later than of Bismarck, to whom he is often compared. Unlike Bismarck, who only gambled when he had to, Cavour was prepared to roll the dice again and again, even when the odds were against him. He had one overriding goal upon his appointment as Prime Minister in 1852, to break Austrian hegemony over Italy. An interesting game, considering Cavour himself lacked any deep sentiment for nationalism, and indeed referred to his project initially as simply the aggrandizement of Piedmont. But ejecting the Habsburgs would allow him to save the cause of moderate liberalism and monarchy for which he stood, perhaps eventually crafting a new Italian nation in the image of Piedmont's constitution, rather than revolutionary republicanism. In objective terms, the power imbalance between Vienna and Turin was stark. Although the small Piedmontese army had to form the core of any force that liberated Italy, there was no way it could oust the Habsburgs alone. It meant Cavour's first task was to secure an ally capable of matching Austrian martial strength. Russia and Prussia were for differing reasons out of the question. That left just Britain, and more practically, France. Before anything though, Cavour needed to gain their sympathy for the Italian cause. Fortunately, he did not have to wait long for an opportunity. In 1853, the Crimean War erupted, shattering at last the old concert of Europe. Britain and France formed a united front against Russian expansion. Austria was nominally the ally of St. Petersburg, and Cavour hoped Franz Joseph would cast his lot in with Nicholas I, which would firmly alienate Vienna from the West. But the young Austrian emperor was shrewder than anticipated, and under the guidance of his Anglophile foreign minister, Buell, Austria remained aloof, tentatively favouring Britain and France in the conflict. It meant neither London or Paris would be interested in schemes for weakening Habsburg power anytime soon. So, Cavour decided to gamble, Originally favouring neutrality, in 1855, with the king's support, he reversed course and declared war on Russia, dispatching a small expeditionary force to the Crimea. Much of Turin was aghast. What interest did this small and weak state have in sending its men to die on the other side of Europe? The answer was soon given. The gallantry of Piedmontese troops won Cavour favour with the West and entitled him to a seat at the peace negotiations. Austria had kept two-thirds of the Russian army tied down by standing mobilised on her border throughout the war, but not one Habsburg soldier had actually fought. In contrast, Piedmont, which realistically exercised no influence whatsoever on the conflict's outcome, had bled for the cause. It was the first sign that Cavour understood perfectly the game of international politics. And more crucially, he knew his audience. At the Paris Peace Conference, he spoke, usually with only half a sheet of notes, briefly and always to the point. The point, of course, being Italian liberation. He won over the British and the French by shepherding his king, Victor Emmanuel, on state visits, and with shameless flattery, comparing the British with ancient Rome, for example. Cavour himself was liked, but seen as unscrupulous. Too French and too tricky, was Lord John Russell's assessment. 
Nonetheless, he made Piedmont's ambitions look legitimate, successfully disassociating the constitutional law governed kingdom from the revolutionary nationalism of Mazzini, and it was in Paris that Cavour's policy first began to take shape. Britain, though sympathetic to Italian nationalism, had little ability, or indeed wished to actively support the cause. But France was different. Napoleon III, newly victorious in the Crimea, now secure on his throne and with French martial prestige restored, looked for new opportunities to influence the European chessboard. Always sympathetic to nationalism, he saw in Piedmont the perfect opportunity to support a cause he had long favoured and extend French influence at the same time. Write confidentially to Walewski, he told Cavour on his final night in Paris, what I might do for Piedmont and for Italy. This was ironic, for the French foreign minister detested the Italian. It was also a great risk. Cavour decided to stake everything on France and the mercurial figure of Napoleon, whose price would be high and reliability questionable. Again, Cavour gambled. He devoted his energies to preparing the Piedmontese economy for war. As Crankshaw describes it, Everything was directed to one end, a fight to the finish between a tiny, parvenu state in the top left-hand corner of Italy and the colossal military machine of Austrian imperialism. It was probably the greatest geostrategic gamble of the 19th century. If Piedmont lost for a second time, there would not be a third. If she was unable to force a confrontation with Austria, bankruptcy loomed because of the burden Cavour would place on the economy. Before anything, however, he had to decisively overcome Walewski's opposition to the Italian cause and convince Napoleon to commit himself. It took months of slow diplomacy until the right opportunity finally appeared. In 1858, an Italian revolutionary attempted to assassinate Napoleon with a bomb. The emperor was unharmed, but shaken by Orsini's motivation. A letter from jail addressed to him declared, Remember that, so long as Italy is not independent, the peace of Europe and your majesty is but an empty dream. Set my country free and the blessings of 25 million people will follow you everywhere and forever. For the ex-revolutionary and member of the Carbonari Napoleon, it had an intoxicating effect. Cavour sensed the time was ripe to finally force a commitment from France. He arranged to meet the Emperor in July at the small town of Plombier. Cavour, for his part, knew everything depended upon this. Pray heaven so to inspire me that I shall not behave like a blockhead at this supreme moment, he wrote to a colleague. He needn't have worried, Napoleon had already decided to support Piedmont in any war against Austria, so long as it was justified internationally, which for practical purposes meant a war of defence rather than aggression. At the meeting, the two men carved up Italy. Piedmont was to take the north, a central Italian state would subsume the remaining independent duchies, the Pope to remain in Rome and Naples in the south. Cavour at this point probably cared little about the actual details. He thought mainly in terms of getting the ball rolling, the specifics could be worked out later. Nonetheless, the agreement offers an insight into both men's motivations. Piedmont would take the richest provinces in the peninsula, vanquishing Austrian power, but would not unite the whole of Italy which Cavour seems to have believed was unfeasible at this stage. For Napoleon, it gave him the satisfaction of having liberated Italy, but also maintained a balance of power in the country which he could theoretically dominate. This was combined with the more substantial reward of Nice and Savoy, restoring France's natural borders along the Alps. All that was now needed was for Austria to declare war. But how to do this? Austria was a satiated power as far as Italy was concerned. It only stood to lose in a war, and by all treaties and agreements was the rightful owner of Lombardy Venetia. Cavour formulated a number of harebrained schemes to push Austria into starting a confrontation. Unfortunately for the Prime Minister, he was still dealing with Napoleon, who was as changeable as ever. By the end of the year, the Emperor seemed to be drifting away from his commitments. Whilst Britain also proved to be surprisingly hostile to any war of liberation, fearing it may escalate into a European-wide conflict, Cavour perhaps for the first time could see his plan beginning to disintegrate. Where it came to Napoleon, however, the only thing certain was his uncertainty, and by the end of 1858, he had turned back to Italy once more, in typically clumsy fashion. I regret that our relations with your government are not so good as they have hitherto been, Napoleon loudly announced to the Austrian ambassador on New Year's Day, 1859. Translated from diplomatic speak, this was as close to an outright insult as one could get in the 19th century. Vienna was furious, but Cavour was revived. I believe that the eventualities of the future will not keep us waiting long, he wrote. At this point, the British tried to intervene, still hoping to keep the peace. 
Cavour brushed them off, scoffing that the present crisis was London's fault in the first place for raising Italian hopes with no intention to fulfil them. But his plan was once again nearly torpedoed by the ever-changing variable of Napoleon. Concerned by British hostility, in March he seemed to favour a Russian plan for a conference on the Italian issue, an exasperated and increasingly desperate Cavour now threatened to publish his secret agreement with Napoleon. Even so, the Italian Prime Minister looked to be on the verge of losing it all. The conference would be held, the Austrian position would be affirmed, and nothing would change. Franz Joseph would not act, Napoleon would wriggle out of his commitment, and Piedmont would have to disarm to stave off bankruptcy. Vienna came to Cavour's rescue. Buol refused to attend the Russian conference if Cavour was given a seat, and would only agree to a proposal for disarmament if Piedmont did so first. In effect, the Austrians had in the end got sick of playing the game. On April the 23rd, they sent an ultimatum demanding the Piedmontese demobilise their army. Cavour was overjoyed. The ultimatum made Austria the aggressor, and when the moment of decision came, as Cavour expected, Napoleon rallied himself and announced French support in accordance with their agreement. The war itself was finished in little over two months. Cavour's military build-up meant the Piedmontese army was just large enough to deter the slovenly Austrian forces from overrunning Turin before the French arrived. On the 4th of June, the Austrians were defeated at Magenta, and on the 24th, the Battle of Solferino drove the Habsburgs from Lombardy for good. It was an indecisive victory, though. The Austrian army remained intact, sheltered by the quadrilateral, a system of modern forts. Breaching these would take time, blood and treasure, none of which Napoleon was willing to expend. Having personally led his army at Solferino, he had been appalled by the bloodshed and feared that Franz Joseph would call for Prussian aid, something that would escalate the war irretrievably. Perhaps more cynically, he saw too great an expansion of Piedmont as a threat to his own chances of dominating Italy. So, without consulting Cavour, the French and Austrian emperors met at the small town of Villafranca and signed an armistice. Piedmont would gain most of Lombardy, but Venetia and the Quadrilateral would remain Austrian, whilst the rulers of the smaller duchies in central Italy, many of them Habsburg relatives driven out at the start of the war, were to be restored. When Cavour received news of the armistice, he was apoplectic, both with Napoleon and his own king for accepting it, declaring that Piedmont should have carried on the war without the French. When Victor Emmanuel rejected this lunacy, Cavour felt he could do nothing but resign. It seemed as if all his work had been snatched away in his moment of triumph. But this catastrophe was short-lived. Cavour remained the most dominant voice in Italian politics, and within six months, Victor Emmanuel had recalled him to office. By this point, the practicalities of the armistice and following Treaty of Zurich had become clear, and Cavour could console himself. Franz Joseph had agreed in the treaty that the Dukes of Central Italy would not be restored by the Austrian army, believing they had the capacity to do it for themselves. This was a fantasy, and it was evident by the time Cavour regained office that this section of the treaty was a dead letter. Soon after, with nothing more than grumbling from Vienna, Piedmont annexed central Italy via plebiscite. Italy was not yet united, but that hadn't been Cavour's overriding aim. He was above everything a pragmatist, who knew nothing could be accomplished without Austria first being defeated. True, the empire still clung to Venice and would continue to do so at the time of Cavour's death in 1861, but it was clear to everyone the Habsburgs were living on borrowed time south of the Alps. And even so, this should in no way diminish Cavour's achievement. It is hard to overstate just how dramatic a change in the Italian situation he had engineered. Austrian hegemony, which seemed to have been confirmed for all time at the Battle of Navarra, had disintegrated. And this was almost entirely down to his diplomatic skill, his ability to seize opportunities, to harness the revolutionary spirit for constitutional purposes, and above all, his willingness to gamble. The road to a unified Italy now lay open.